Honestly, how often do we come across a conversation that completely changes our perspective about something that is going to affect us professionally or personally? Well, this is that kind of a conversation. Inspiring, motivating and giving us the kind of perspective we desperately need. Ladies and gentlemen, The One Take Show, a podcast where we celebrate incredible conversation with some fantastic people, brings you this episode in conversation with Mr. Kapil Sankhla. Sir is a managing partner at Sankhla & Associates. In this episode, he talks about his journey with law. He talks about his experience as a first-generation lawyer, which I personally believe there is a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience that we can actually learn from. He also shares his opinion on a very burning issue, the transparency and arbitrariness in filing charge sheets. If you like this episode, drop a like, drop me a comment about what you think about this episode, what can be improved and what else I can do with this podcast. And so ladies and gentlemen, let's jump right in. Hello sir, welcome to the One Take show. I am so excited to have this opportunity to talk to you. I think I have followed you on LinkedIn on various platforms because we as law students get this opportunity to learn from the leaders and luminaries who are paving the path and inspiring everyone in the fresh legal sphere to look up to and actually follow your footsteps and this opportunity is going to enlighten so many law students so many legal aspirants who are going to tune into this conversation so i'm truly truly grateful for this opportunity thank you so much for taking time off your really busy schedule and sitting down with me for this conversation thank you for having me over it's an absolute honor to talk to all you youngsters you know you guys are the future and i can see how bright the future is with everything that you guys are doing here. thank you for having me over so the pleasure is all ours i believe this opportunity needs to be exploited because it will be a crime on my part not to take the full benefit out of this so before we get into the substantial part of our conversation i would love to know about your journey i think we can learn a lot about uh, law we can learn a lot about litigation we can learn a lot about this entire industry in toto from your experience itself so what inspired you to do law and what was your experience with law school and perhaps your experience with litigation sure you know it's kind of it's it's very hard to believe that's more than two decades that i've been a lawyer and i've been running a law firm mm-hmm. and we've managed to create the kind of reputation that we have in the litigation and the strategy sphere as many of you uh, are aware that i i love to discuss law you know and to uh, take on engagements like these to teach law not just the theory of law but the practical aspect of law uh you know i read this somewhere before i talk about you know the entire journey and whatever there is i read this somewhere and that's there in my office you know it says somebody said this that my job as a lawyer is to digest other people's pain it okay. is bitter painful tear filled reminiscent mm-hmm. of times past that have been passed it's not a job that you want it's not a job that's worth it mm-hmm. but we toil because it just may change the society right i think it's very beautiful because when i became a lawyer i had no idea what i want to do but mm-hmm. i just interacted with some very senior very bright brilliant lawyers uh, in supreme court uh, strategy sphere people who hadn't entered the court but were strategists in their own right i think you're aware that i was a part of the urea scam and a lot of other matters pertaining to that and so there were some brilliant lawyers from all across india who would come to delhi during these matters and the whole idea that i learned from them is that they all wanted to change the society they were all lawyers who had toiled on the constitutional sphere on the criminal sphere also on the writ jurisdiction etc and had mm-hmm. you know kind of made an endeavor to somehow improve the society or the law as we know now mm-hmm. and i think that has been a guiding principle that i've always had to somehow make a difference to somehow uh, you know make a change to somehow create a name and uh, you know somebody once told me that you should be aware why you are in this profession or why you are in the business of law mm-hmm. and would you and, and do you take it as as a profession of law or business of law and that's very important right because right. When, it, when it comes to making money yeah you know there there are easier ways of going about it mm-hmm. law is a very very stressful profession it takes a lot from you i mean you know you're reading all the time you're preparing matters you enter the court with the best of 
you know the strategy is the best of argument and you don't have the court with you mm-hmm. and it hits you and every day it hits you i mean imagine that but you do it for that little victory that you get that one matter that you argue that one bail that you managed to get through that one stay that you managed or that one judgment that would be referred with your name you do it for that isn't it right mm-hmm. so you choose whether you are going for the profession of law which mm-hmm. probably would not bring you so much money but would get you that reputation would let you sleep well at night knowing that you managed to make some change or you are moving towards making a change or the business of law which is completely different mm-hmm. as a first generation lawyer this is something that i fought with because i understood the profession of law because this is what was taught to me mm-hmm. how i'm supposed to argue prepare read briefs etc judgments fine judgments but nobody really taught us the business of law okay how how do you get the clients how do you manage your clients how do you what do you charge how do you charge right right and that's something that i know for a fact because i interact with so many of you youngsters uh, that you know that is something that is not really clear to a lot of young lawyers especially first generation lawyers like me right, right. so that's something that's that's there uh, mm-hmm. to talk about my journey uh, with law is it i have a very checkered past you know i never thought of being a lawyer i was fortunate to get through srcc one of the i think the best colleges in india right and i was foolish enough to kind of leave that jump ship and you know do ihm pools and i got to ihm pools as it is one of still one of the best for hotel management and i worked in the hotel industry i was a barman wow. at tj very wow. proud of that fact <laughs> and on a whim i actually gave exams and i got mm-hmm. through uh, uh, law fac and oh, uh, lc and uh, you know and i thought that you know let me just do this let it be a stepping stone for something bigger and better Mm-hmm. and uh, it's just that when i went to clc i just realized that it was just like living college all over again and what i did was i joined a lawyer mm-hmm. uh, and i got me transferred from clc to lc1 the best thing that happened to me was this right because for two and a half years i was working with a lawyer in the trial court mm-hmm. nearly as his own she carrying his files uh, you know hearing him argue discuss the strategies make notes Mm-hmm. and and that's something that taught me and and this is very interesting mm-hmm. that when i when i joined this senior uh, you know what had happened was that for the s- first 6 months all he made me do was translate the fir from hindi to english and paginate okay. his file okay and today and you know i'm very sorry to say this you know a lot of youngsters believe that they're entitled and this is dar ka kaam munshi's work and they do not have it hmm and i right. hated my senior for doing this you know translating the fir and and paginating the file till when i went and i was giving my exam it kind of just hit me that i only knew the structure of how to make a complaint what are the sections what are the meaning of most of the sections and i also right. knew how a civil trial commences i mean the pleading the written statement the replication the applications which are filed Mm-hmm. it was there automatically because i was just paginating these files every day mm-hmm. i was doing post its i was tagging them mm-hmm. and i was translating these fir so my criminal law practice i mean criminal law was already clear to me okay. when i when i for my exams and my civil law was kind of clear because i could understand how the matter proceeds mm-hmm. and that's something that i would like to teach all you youngsters you know never say no to a work never think that it is beneath you right right coming back uh nothing ever goes for a waste so my my stint with srcc my stint with ihm pusa my working in the hotel and we used to have something called break shift break shift was when you work for 12 or 16 hours a day wow wow and the okay. fact that i could do that gave me the belief that i could sit and work on a file for 8 hours and i would always believe right. yeah i've actually you know i've i've done hotel management yeah i've worked for 16 hours mm-hmm. i've done a break shift. Mm-hmm. and i can do this so all of it that you have done are doing or will do will help you in this profession that's the beauty of this profession mm-hmm. right. keep hustling keep doing things it doesn't matter what you're doing it's all going to make sense eventually right yeah yeah i mean that's that's something very important that i that that i've learned over the years mm-hmm. 
right so i think this is so fascinating i have so many follow up questions to uh, perhaps almost every part of your journey but i will ask you very uh, specifically in a very chronological manner starting from uh, the first fact you've mentioned that you were first generation lawyer and uh, you've yep. had to experience the struggles that usually all the first generation lawyers have to face we as law students who uh, obviously look to forward to litigation are often intimidated by the fact that litigation is very difficult for first generation lawyers how did you overcome those challenges i mean obviously you talked about your experience as the first hand first jobs that you talk about but were there other such obstacles that you faced and how did you overcome them of course many and i still do i mean if i was a second or a third generation lawyer a lot of things would be set you know my clerks wouldn't run away i would have a stenographer pass down from my father who would know exactly what to type <laughs> you know you are you are at a loss you like a small dinghy boat in the vast ocean as a litigation lawyer right uh, if if you are a first generation litigation lawyer <laughs> you know i believe that's my belief a litigation lawyer especially a criminal lawyer or a constitutional lawyer Mm-hmm. i believe that we are the last bastions of democracy and wow. i honestly believe that. i believe that we are we are the protector of the realms if if you're a game of thrones fan you know you're the night guard yes yes you know, yes because imagine that mm-hmm. if you if there weren't any criminal lawyers right imagine if there weren't any litigation lawyers mm-hmm. you would have the prosecution or the government road rolling over the entire country you stop them you question them you challenge them every day and that itself right is amazing it mm-hmm. doesn't really matter whether you win or lose the fact is that you question the government that right. you question the prosecution that you question the investigating officer that mm-hmm. you stand in the court and you know that there is this client and the entire state machinery is against him but you're standing tall deep mm-hmm. inside you're scared out of your wits but you're standing tall right 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 sir so you know if you believe that and if you're proud of the fact that as a litigation lawyer it's mm-hmm. not it's not just about earning your you know daily wages so to say it's it's not about it's not just about you know making enough that i go home with something but the fact that you are somehow protecting democracy that you're protecting liberty that you're protecting humanity mm-hmm. is the higher purpose as yeah. a litigation lawyer right and so it doesn't really matter you know as a first generation lawyer a lot of difficulties i didn't have a chamber i couldn't afford a chamber i used to sit in tisari outside the gold canteen there used to be a tree and mm-hmm. i used to sit under that 20 plus years back it was called scandal point mm-hmm. the strategy was that if you if you arrive if you arrive in in tisari at 9:15 mm-hmm. you would find that table empty and you could then you know you know set your shop there so to say <laughs> I'm telling you something really funny, and I don't think anybody else knows this. Mm-hmm. But I would have so that tree was shared by a shoe polish wala, and wow. and if, and you know whenever my client would come, irrespective mm-hmm. whether he's paying me or not, that bugger shoe wala would come and take the shoes to polish. Wow. And at the end of the day, if I made money or not wasn't important, but the shoe wala would be there for forty-five rupees or fifty rupees for all the shoe polish that he did for my clients. Mm-hmm. But. but it's amazing i mean that journey is amazing right you know these stories are amazing and as i said that you know it's your you really have to look deep within and 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 ask yourself mm-hmm. do you want to be in the business of law or do you want to be in the profession of law what a- because trust me in profession of law you may think that you will not earn as much as your colleagues were earning you know in the business of law are also people who probably join companies etc mm-hmm. but i'll tell you a secret and that's a secret that i've realized that if you choose to be in the profession of law mm-hmm. you might not make as much as somebody else that you think who's making but you will always make enough as much as you want perfect it would be delayed but it would never be denied right so money that somebody else has earned in the profession of law today mm-hmm. you might get it after 3 years but the fact that you're sticking around and you're doing the best you can that you're preparing your brief that you're going to the court day in and day out and fighting the system mm-hmm. your time will come it is inevitable you know that movie right, apna time milega inevitable <laughs> right sir right i mean 
I am really scared that this might this might come off as sick of fancy, but I think this story of yours sounds like Prem Chand Ji ka koi afsana, and I'm really fan of this. Uh, the idea here that you had to go through the struggle that you did and still accomplish uh, what you have. I think your story from uh, starting off as a first generation lawyer to establishing and now leading uh, Sankla and Associates is, is itself. an inspiration for any uh, fresh legal aspirant or law student who wants to enter into this industry this one thing that i've noticed that you've mentioned is about social relevance and the responsibility of ethics that lawyers need to have especially when it comes to practice of law as against the business of law uh, it reminds right. me of a conversation i've had with uh, dr adit sandhi and uh, sir said something very similar and i would love to know your opinion on this uh, the issue he highlighted was that in the recent times various law schools especially nlus for Uh, the superior sense of position that they assume which might not be true have now sort of lost their position of relevance when it comes to social responsibility or uh, let's say alone in very brute words the national law schools are not very inclined towards litigation and taking up the practice law, of law do you have any opinion on that well that's partially right but that's actually painting with a very very white very very white brush Mm-hmm. uh see every college or most of the colleges have a particular structure mm-hmm. uh their students right so certain colleges for example my college delhi university is a very litigation oriented college right mm-hmm. its its structure is that they would teach you a section they would teach teach you landmark judgments they would discuss the judgment mm-hmm. so when you pass out you're automatically oriented towards research an argument because that's what you've been doing day in and day out so you become a litigation lawyer mm-hmm. there are certain colleges that teach you more about research and analysis mm-hmm. and those and those colleges those students probably are catering to a certain section or certain facet of law right i will not comment on whether that's right or wrong mm-hmm. because the colleges that you mentioned are also colleges that usually cater as law researchers to most of the high courts and supreme court right right the fact is that it's the structure of education mm-hmm. and to reiterate again litigation is not easy right litigation for first 10 years is extremely difficult right sir and my senior my senior so when when i started as a lawyer and i would hear my senior and couple of very very great lawyers arguing matters in court mm-hmm. and i would you know i would be fascinated and i asked my senior once i said sir how is it i mean don't you feel any fear or you know whatever i mean don't you feel anything in your heart when you're arguing the matter he said you know after 10 years couple mm-hmm. you would also be in a stage where you are disconnected with the matter right and i thought that was brilliant and 20 years plus when i'm god's been extremely kind we've done some brilliant matters i mean 390 million dollar uh, arbitration to uh, handling work for home ministers and chief ministers and uh, petroleum disputes aviation disputes i've been lead counsel in a lot of matters i am engaged in a lot of matters but the fact is that 20 plus years when i'm standing in the court i have five openings mm-hmm. five different strategies and i'm wondering what am i supposed to start my argument with and i shared this with another senior lawyer Mm-hmm. a wonderful lawyer in our high court and i was telling him and i said you know i still feel scared and i think my senior was wrong or there's something wrong with me mm-hmm. and he said that couple when i start my argument my heart is sinking okay wow because i so desperately want to ensure that my client gets relief mm-hmm. and that couple is called empathy and the day wow. you lose empathy you will lose out on being a human being so it's fine I think it's it's good that you still still feel that emotion mm-hmm. for your client and for your brief. Right. And that's something that I really wanted to share with you youngsters because I'm sure you like me, many of you like me would also feel that and would wonder why is it that we feel scared or you know lost or whatever. Mhm. When we're standing in the court on that dais and about to start our argument. Right. And there's another thing that somebody once told me. Yeah. he he wants told me and that's something that you know i believe now with the kind of matters that we've done mm-hmm. that it's better to do one big matter than to do 100 small matters to learn the law which is absolutely true because right. when you're doing this huge gigantic matter 
you, you're preparing on so many facets. You know that the judge would ask you a question from any angle and so you're prepared. Right. So you know, he said that it's better to do one big matter than 100 small matters. But he also said this, that you better do well those 100 small matters that mm -hmm. you have so that you're able to do that one big one matter. Big matter. Right. Yeah. And I don't right. think anybody could have put this better. Mm -hmm. So think differently, be focused, stick around. That's it. Right, sir. Although I think these uh, three words that you've just pointed out are the holy grail that every law student and legal aspirant should uh, go ahead with, grow up with and actually live up to. But uh, I would still ask you this question because I think a lot of my listeners would really need to listen to this is that from starting professor, first generation lawyer to now leading uh, Sakla and Associates, you, if you had to look back in time and you had to advise yourself uh, when it comes to starting off in litigation, what different perspectives would you now provide your younger self or what sort of different ideas or suggestions would you give to young lawyers who are entering the industry now? Oh, that's a good question actually. Thank you. If I had to advise myself would be this, when I started as a lawyer, I was scared to ask fees. Mm -hmm. I knew that I'm going to, you know, work my butt off, so to say. But I was always scared to ask fees. I just didn't know what the right fees is. And I would always underquote. Mm -hmm. And I had a I had a lawyer who subsequently became a judge. He had come to my house dinner and he asked me how much do you charge? And I said, I think those days I said something to the effect of fifteen thousand. And I was mm -hmm. no twenty five thousand and I was charging much less than that. And he said that tomorrow when you go and there's a new client that comes, you charge one and a half lakh and I said, they'll run away. What are you saying? <laughs> right. You know? right. And he said, yes, he will go away. But then he talks about you. He will always say that there is a lawyer who charges one and a half lakh. Okay. So you might, you might not get six matters or seven matters, but the eighth or ninth matter who comes, the judge, lawyer who comes, uh, mm -hmm. client who comes, is going to pay you that amount. And it is right. better to do lesser matters and work very very hard mm -hmm. in those matters then to have a factory syndrome that most of the lower court lawyers have okay so if i had to i would say this uh, don't say no to a case which we still don't but be mm -hmm. very clear about your fees you know your worth mm -hmm. because it is better that you do not do a matter than to do a matter and be unhappy about it right Right. And secondly, it is better to be paid your worth and you justify it because then you can go and buy those books that you wanted, buy those softwares that you want. Right. You know, you're able to sit for two more hours in the library knowing that you don't have to rush to another matter here. Let, let me make this money because I need this money. Mm -hmm. That's one. Second, if I had to. So I was always very confident. I mean, that's there, you know. Mm -hmm. So I can't really tell myself that be more confident because then that would be arrogance. But <laughs> what I would probably tell myself and something that I have realized much later is learn to collaborate. Okay. All right to trust another lawyer and bring him on, on, on board. Mm -hmm. And what I did not do when I was young was never briefed seniors. Okay. I didn't brief seniors because I was already arguing, as I told you, because of the unique history that I had, I was already arguing matters. When I passed out, I was already arguing matters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't really have to brief seniors, but I realized much later that it's also great to go and brief a senior mm -hmm. who you trust. Because when you're briefing a senior, you learn certain strategies. Right. And that's right. something, something that experience is going to teach you much later. Mm -hmm. Right. And and uh, one more thing, if if I could, and I did that, so that's something that I've noticed about youngsters now. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem with youngsters usually now is what I see is that they want to work in a firm or with a lawyer for one year and then jump ship and work with somebody else. They're actually thinking that they're, they're, they're enjoying different flavors. Okay. No, law is not like that. Right. In the first year, no senior is going to trust you, right? He's not going to give you juicy matters. He's not going to say, go argue. It's all right. I trust you. Clients are not going to trust you. Right. It starts happening in the second year or the third year. I stuck around for around five, six years. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the benefit of being able to handle an entire wing for my senior. Right. 
where those those clients would say that we are ready to pay for Mr. Sankla's presence when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But that only happened because my senior started trusting me, and that would only happen with time. So if you don't think of jumping ship after one year, stick around. Okay. Because when you do, the senior is going to trust you. Then he's going to also trust you with the tricks and trades, and the secret sauces that help him. Then you belong to that stable. And when you belong to that stable, you you imbibe his style, mm -hmm. you imbibe his strategy on reading and pre and preparing your matters. Perfect, perfect. That's it. I think yeah. this this uh, part of our conversation is the bible for every first generation lawyer to look up to and actually follow word by word. Uh, the fact that we as law students who intern often have difficult time with the reading files, understanding the writs and going through the matters, researching, filing and everything that our seniors give us as uh, some sort of job. We often feel, okay, this is probably mundane. We can do better. We can do better. We can go to a law, law firm and do better. I think that mindset needs to change and perhaps uh, engaging the work so that we can learn from it can actually add a lot of value to our own perspectives. I think this conversation will really help a lot of law students. This now allows me to move towards the substantial part of our conversation, which I'm really excited about. In our last conversation, uh, you mentioned that there uh, there is an issue that is uh, some that is in your mind that you're thinking about, and uh, there's an issue that needs to be talked about. The issue of transparency, the issue of when we talk about arbitrariness, when it comes to charge sheet filing, when it comes to investigations, and the issue of fair disclosure. So I won't take uh, much of this space. I think it would be uh, brilliant to for any law student to learn this directly from you. So uh, could you please conceptually let us know what exactly is the uh, is the idea here that you're propounding? All right, we've been blessed that we have managed to change certain laws over the years. We were in the forefront in the changing the juvenile age, etc. Mm -hmm. Now this is another thing that that irking me on the criminal side. Many of you know uh, the whole process of criminal law. You know that once the investigation is over, the investigating officer files a report before the court. And that's the entire part of his investigation, uh, you know, that is be as it may, the witnesses, the documents, uh, mm -hmm. FSL report, whatever there is. And the court goes through that police report to right. come up to, to frame charge. So that's the first time the court applies its mind mm -hmm. to the case at hand and would either discharge the accused or charge the accused and then the entire trial process starts. Mm -hmm. Now imagine this, that there is the entire state machine, we are talking about you know there are like millions and millions of cases and the mm -hmm. judiciary is extremely burdened. Right. But the interesting part is a lot of people ask this question, why do most of the accused eventually are acquitted? Is there something wrong with our judicial system or you know, or is it because of corruption or because the witnesses do not stand scrutiny or whatever? Mm -hmm. The difficulty here is, the difficulty here is that the, invest, that the law mandates that the investigating officer will file that report which is called the charge sheet under 173 mm -hmm. as per his whims and fancy. Okay. He will he is not duty bound to file everything that is disclosed or that comes to his notice. So right. if, for example, during the course of investigation, he is able to find out that, the, uh, that there is certain evidence that shows that this particular person is has been wrongly implicated or okay. that there is something that kind of waters down the case against the mm -hmm. accused, he is not duty bound to disclose it. Okay. Imagine this, the entire state machinery is going to pay, file a police report, the judge is going to apply his mind for the first time on it. Eventually it is on the accused to find out what is in his favor, bring it in defense evidence and then secure uh, an acquittal. That's, mm -hmm. that's such a waste of, of our funds of government machinery of judicial process. Mm -hmm. Internationally it is called the law fair disclosure. Right. Where whatever has been found out by the investigating officer shall be disclosed to the accused. Right. And and I think that is very fair. And that, sh that would prove, that would show that we too are a developed country. That our judicial system, our investigative system, our, our prosecution is developed 
and that we respect not only the court's time but also human life and we are not a we are not into persecution but we are into fair prosecution right right so that is something that i am fighting for and i wish and i hope that num- the number of you that you're listening to this would mm-hmm. also you know, kind of talk about this discuss this bring it to four make a change right so i think this is a very fascinating idea uh before i move on to other part i think i just have one follow up question to this uh reading up a little bit about this gave me a little bit idea as to how uh the filing of charge sheet and how uh this entire process could be detrimental to the basic concepts of justice fairness good conscience and we talk about the disclosure of uh, the various documents per se if i may say documents uh there's yeah. one issue that comes here is that the documents which are being used by the prosecution as against all the documents or the evidences that are available or have been acquired by the investigating officer uh the said accused person for their own defense might only get the documents which are being used by the prosecution perhaps not all the documents which are in the collection is that true and uh, does that also signal us in the direction that you have previously talked about this is absolutely right so the so the iu is not bound to disclose all the documents or evidences within but is only bound to file those documents and evidences that they rely upon okay and i think that unfairness of it all and that is something that needs to to be changed right right sir and my only last question in this is we understand it is unfair but from a jurisprudence point of view uh when we say that indian judicial uh history we have seen an evolution when it comes to criminal law with respect to these effects how big yeah. of a problem is it that we as law students should engage into how detrimental is this that for about 70 75 years or 76 years there hasn't been any development of such magnitude which could have already solved this problem the reason why this problem actually persists even today so how big of a problem is this really for our indian judicial system so there are two parts of this mm-hmm. one uh unfortunately we as indians believe in knee jerk reaction okay so so when the delhi bus rape happened mm-hmm. our uh, laws were changed pertaining to rape system mm-hmm. was overhauled when x happened we again changed the laws right i mean now we of course have the dr ranveer singh committee Mm-hmm. talking about overhauling the criminal system law system mm-hmm. but the fact is that we have a very myopic view and that myopic view comes from the fact that the people who talk about changing the law are usually the theorists and not the practical lawyers and legal luminaries right so the theory of law would say that mm-hmm. an accused gets acquitted because he manages to win over the witnesses and okay. and and because they turn hostile okay. what they do not what they do not see is that the investigating officer could have trumped up those those charges would have mm-hmm. brought uh, witnesses that were actually not there would have created evidence mm-hmm. either in his haste to mm-hmm. to file the charge sheet because it has to be filed within 60 days or 90 days Right. or because he was lazy or because he had colluded with somebody or for whatever reason mm-hmm. and so if the charge sheet is bad if if a witness that does not exist and a witness is created mm-hmm. then during cross examination he will break right if there is if there is unimpeachable evidence in favor of the accused that he wasn't there at that spot at that time mm-hmm. and the iu that hasn't filed it Mm-hmm. then the accused will file it during defense evidence right so that's the first part the second part of it is it is it is an issue that requires introspection because mm-hmm. our judicial system is slow right. as fast as it wants to be it cannot because of the sheer magnitude of matters mm-hmm. we have brilliant judges but what do you do when they have 75 78 matters 80 matters a day to take care of Mm-hmm. Imagine that the poor judge is sitting from ten o'clock till four o'clock, has to decide eighty matters or seventy matters. Mm-hmm. Now, if the onus is put on the investigating officer that he will give fair disclosure, I right. think at least one third of those matters would not be filed, mm-hmm. or they would be discharged during pre-litig pre-trial stage. Right. Right. So mm-hmm. one 
you help the entire system second second you're making the investigating officer responsible right no false cases no fabricated cases no trumped up charges mm-hmm. thirdly you're respecting human life right you don't have people fighting for 10 years 12 years only to eventually come out and say you know i've been acquitted mm-hmm. five it's our resources it's your and my taxes right that's what feeding the investigating officer and the entire mechanism of investigation mm-hmm. you're making the system responsible and i think it's high time we do that right Perfect. yep yes yes sir. i think oh my god this has this opens uh, i think i have realized that there is an entire area of research that i now need to read up uh into and perhaps learn more about so that i can also form such opinions and understand uh in depth about exactly what is the situation and perhaps contribute in later stages of my career and so do all the law students and every legal aspirant thank you so much for this wonderful wonderful conversation so do you have any closing remarks for our uh, listeners not at all as i said that i'm extremely fascinated i'm honored to be here and it's actually a pleasure meeting all you youngsters who are doing so phenomenally well using this time never doubt yourself stick around keep doing what you guys are doing as i said your time is going to come so that's that thank you for having me over absolute pleasure thank you so much so i think this has been this has been an absolute honor for me uh, we would love to live up to every expectation every milestone every pedestal that has been set for us thank you so much for this opportunity thank you for your time